Bonsoir, mesdames, messieurs. Bienvenue à l'Université Concordia. Good evening and welcome. I'm Benoît Antoine Bacon, Provost and Vice President of Academic Affairs here at Concordia. I'm very pleased to welcome you all for our first Thinking Out Loud event of the year. Thinking Out Loud, as many of you will know, is a series of public conversations on topics that matter. It's one of the ways that we connect our research here at Concordia directly with society. It's about creating conversations that go well beyond sound bites and cliches. And tonight we're talking about journalism and human rights. Many thanks to the International Press Institute for its assistance in making the event possible. Journalism and human rights are explicitly linked. Journalists are tasked with bringing critical context to world events. Our conversation sadly appears particularly timely. We're in the midst of a major refugee crisis in Syria. Over the past two weeks, we've been witness to brutal attacks, first in Beirut and then last Friday in Paris. Our thoughts are with the victims and their loved ones. Journalists shape our understanding of the world. And tonight, we consider the many issues around their important work and human rights. So let's get started. First, please join me in welcoming our moderator for tonight from the Globe and Mail, foreign editor Susan Sachs. Welcome, Susan. Thanks Thank for you. being here with us. And now, please help me welcome our conversationalists this evening. First, journalist and columnist Amberin Zaman. <laughs> Amberin, great to have you. And finally, Kyle Matthews from Concordia's Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies. Susan, over to you. Thanks. Well, welcome all, and uh, thank you for coming. Thank you, Amber, and thank you, Kyle. It's a uh, it's great honor to be here. Um, first, before we get started, the, uh, no one from the International Press Institute uh, was able to come, but they've asked me to read a statement from their executive director. They're a very, very fine organization that uh, uh, is really responsible for very great studies and very great work in promotion of freedom of the press. So this is a message from the IPI executive director, Barbara Trionfi. On behalf of the IPI, I'd like to offer a warm welcome to you all. We're sorry that we can't be there in person, but we want to thank Amber and Zaman, Kyle Matthews, and Susan Sachs for being here. That's me. And we want to thank Concordia University and its Thinking Out Loud series and the Globe and Mail for making this wonderful, wonderful event possible. We also want to thank all of you who are in the audience tonight or watching online. We're extremely pleased that you have joined us. Recent events in Turkey have shown yet again the importance that the ability to speak and share ideas freely has to democracy. The same holds true around the world. We hope that you enjoyed tonight's discussion and that it helps you better understand what is happening in Turkey and why that's so significant. And we hope that it underscores the need to uphold the fundamental human rights of free expression and press freedom and inspires you to all join, in us, join with us in working to do so. So again, thank you for being here. We have a lot to talk about. The issue of uh, Turkey itself is a fascinating and uh, um, a fascinating subject that we can speak about all night long, and it's the same for press freedom. I think I'll just give you a little bit of introduction before we go and start a discussion between Kyle and Ambrin. Um, I have lived in Turkey, so I think I can say and, st and, and studied it that whether it's been under military rule or civilian rule, before the, the AK Party came to power and during its continuing reign these past 13 years, uh, it's always and has long been a country where saying what powerful people don't want you to say or writing what powerful people don't want you to write could be fatal. 
let's not kid ourselves, this toxic atmosphere that we're seeing now is, um, is something that predates this government. It, maybe it will uh, post-date it as well. It's not particular to this president, and it's probably not particular to this set of media owners, because they change. Um, but it does matter to us about Turkey, because it's, whether it's repressive or not. It's always been Turkey. There's the, you know, the uh, um, almost cliche of Turkey as a bridge between East and West. At a point not that long ago, Turkey was held up by Western leaders as an absolute model for Islamist democracy. Um, the lack of information, a tame citizenry, a muzzled press in any country, that can give birth to extreme reactions. And that's a concern for us all, especially uh, given Turkey's location, its importance, its central role in so many of the crises that we're experiencing now. Um, I might also just add as a personal note, uh, to personal addition to that, that another reason that, we're, that Turkey matters, in addition to the way it affects Ambrin and the way it affects Kyle's work, is that it's almost a living laboratory of perhaps the abuse that can be made of the the security laws and the restrictions that we're seeing, not just in the Middle East, not just in dictatorships, not just in authoritarian countries like Turkey um, and elsewhere, but um, all the reactions to 9-11. It's a living laboratory of perhaps where uh, freedom of expression, criticism, um, independence of thought can be easily conflated, thanks to the laws in place, with um, anti-societal actions. And I think it's something for that reason that this discussion is very important. So enough of me. I'm going to start with, uh, with our special guest, Amron. Um, you have the dubious distinction of having been insulted publicly president by the, um, personally by the president of Turkey. Um, you have been fired for writing articles that were deemed critical of the government by a media company that wasn't state-owned, but wanted to curry favor. You are now involved in three judicial processes that are very, uh, very serious, and one of them in which you have been accused of uh, under terrorism laws. This is really serious. What happened? A few years ago, as I said, uh, Turkey was held up and this government held up as perhaps the, the government that could strengthen democracy in Turkey. What went wrong? Well, it's a very complex uh, picture in Turkey today. As you pointed out, the government gave us hope for the first time that actually Turkey was fully on the path to democracy, and that's obviously what the European Union believed when it opened full membership talks with Turkey in 2005, and I was one of the great cheerleaders of this government. Because, as you know, for the longest time, the army pretty much ran the country, and for the first time we had a government in power that was willing to take the army on, and actually was successful in doing so, and we believed that this was leading us towards a full-blooded Western-style democracy. But what happened was that when this government defanged the army, when it consolidated its own power, it then began to accumulate it at the expense of the others in Turkey who believed that they would be creating space for us as well. And who am I talking about? I'm talking about the Kurds. I'm talking about the Alevis. I'm talking about women. And unfortunately, we feel extremely disappointed, obviously, and angry, increasingly angry at the way this government is marginalizing, suppressing everyone, just so that they can consolidate their own power. Kyle, when you see the kinds of the, the, the very personal um, pursuit of Amron and, and other journalists there, what kind of warning signals does that behavior send to you, uh, especially in a country where this president was just re-elected by a very large, or his party was re-elected by a large margin? What does it say to you when, when independent journalists are um, pursued in this, this very personal and very dangerous way? 
I think it's very troubling. Um, I, I think, you know, our work at Concordia at the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies, we observe countries that are at risk of, of, of political violence and human rights abuses. And, and uh, one of the projects set up by my colleague, Dr. Frank Chalk, um, modeled after the Rwandan genocide, was to, to observe and monitor domestic media to see, uh, particularly look for warning signs of repression against political opposition or also against journalists. And I think Turkey, what we've seen, and, and it's true, Turkey has never been the, 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 the perfect society, no, no country is, but we have seen an increase in um, some of this uh, repression against individual journalists. We have, uh, you know, just in the news here in Canada, you know, Vice News came out of Canada, came out of Montreal, and we now have a, a Vice fixer who's in prison in, um, in Turkey. Uh, we have increasingly dangerous signs that, um, that, that personal space for journalists to tell the outside world what's really happening, to open our eyes to what's happening. We, you know, in Canada, we don't have uh, a lot of media people in the Middle East anymore. We rely on external media to tell us that. And Turkey, I think, is, is troubling for us because we see there's a, a strange thing going on in the region with Syria, uh, with a, a larger regional conflict, but we're not able to get information because those independent voices telling the truth, asking the tough questions, are being silenced and actually run out of the country. Is that true? Are we not getting, are we not getting news? Are we not getting the truth? Are we not getting all that can be learned from what's going on in Turkey and what Turks, the Turkish well, first of all, forces are doing? There's other, there's the, other means, yeah? The suppression yeah? of the Turkish media is, is unremitting. And there, is, there are practically no critical um, outlets left. Just a few days ago, another TV station was taken off the air, uh, affiliated with the Gulenists, the Samaniola TV, prior, just before the elections. The IPEC group, which is also affiliated with the Gulenists, uh, their TV channels and newspapers were seized. Uh, and so certainly that's true of the Turkish public, that they are no longer privy to uh, critical views of the government. So all you have is just propaganda. Uh, but what's also troubling, as Kyle said, is the fact that now the government is also targeting the Western press. Uh, you know, it's quite different to the days when you were the New York Times correspondent in Turkey. Now, uh, foreign journalists who, you know, write stories that make the government uncomfortable can face uh, expulsion, as did Frederike Gerding, mm -hmm. a Dutch journalist recently, who was prosecuted, in fact, prior to her expulsion on terror charges. She was accused of uh, promoting the PKK, the Kurdish rebel group. And very often you find our president, uh, you know, singling out publications like the New York Times, The Economist, which I uh, wrote for for 17 years. and. Uh, accusing them of being part of some kind of global conspiracy that's out to undermine uh, Turkey, to overthrow his government. And so, you know, every single year when my fo colleagues in the Western press are, are getting ready to renew their press accreditation, they, they really worry, will I be accredited again this year? So they feel that pressure very intensely. And to what degree will that begin to influence their reporting? I wonder. And how many fixers will be willing now today to go out with TV crews and, you know, report on what's happening along the Turkish border with ISIS, with other groups? You know, there's an incredible amount of pressure being placed on journalists uh, across the ideological divide within Turkey itself, but now increasingly on the foreign media too. Tell us how that might have affected when, when you were reporting in Turkey. How, how did you deal with that pressure and perhaps your internal um, uh, protective instinct, um, how did you see your own journalism or your own uh, reporting, your own speaking change, if at all, um, during this time? Well, I'd like to believe that it hasn't. Uh, but as you pointed out in your introductory remarks, there's always been pressure on journalists in Turkey and also even on the foreign press. In the 90s, Elisa Marcus, a reporter for Reuters, was prosecuted uh, on charges of, again, uh, promoting the PKK, but that was really a, a very isolated 
incident. But yes, there were red lines, and the Kurds were a very big red line in those days. So anyone who wrote, you know, was perceived as somehow supporting the PKK uh, became a target. And certainly Kurdish journalists were killed in those days. So people were paying uh, with their lives uh, for reporting on what was going on in the southeast, but it was very localized. So, as a foreign, report, as a reporter for the foreign media, when I was writing for the Washington Post and others, I would go to the southeast. Yes, different rules applied there, and obviously, each time I went on a reporting trip there, came back with my stories, interviewing the PKK, etc. I did obviously feel nervous, but once I was out, I was out. Mm -hmm. But now. All across the country, you know, it's it's quite different now. There's not one red line. There are all kinds of red lines. So, whether you're writing about the Kurds, whether you're writing about Erdogan, about corruption, about their foreign policy, about the Syrian policy, about what ISIS is doing in Turkey and what Turkey may should be doing to stop ISIS, everything is almost a red line. It's you know, uh, it's suffocating actually. It, it sounds um, also from your experience, and, and Kyle, tell us if this is something you've noticed around. What, what is also significant about the situation in Turkey now is that it's, it's the state, and it's the party, and it's the president, but there's a collusion from, uh, perhaps from the business elite, uh, just who runs across the same um, ever-present red lines as you. How does that work itself out, and how does that, what does that tell us about the possibility of ever getting out of the cycle of repression and fear and and um, pursuit? I'll uh, make, you want to go I'll ahead? make yeah. initial comments, but I'm sure you'll yeah. have some that are much deeper than mine. I, I, th I think it's very frightening when you see a state that has holds a lot of power, just won a major election, um, has full political power, and is still feels it obliged to actually. Uh, pressure yeah. businesses, uh, private media, to actually toe the line. Um, I think you know a society loses a tremendous amount of knowledge and liberty to question uh, public policies, to question where that country is going. Uh, it literally, I think, blinds a society from making the informed debates that the fu their future and the future of their children uh, are in place. And and it, like you said, it's a spiral. How do you get out of that uh, when you get uh, a government that's willing just to hold on to power at whatever cost and and literally um, take away those freedoms from society. Um, usually that's not a trajectory that ends well. Um, and I, I think it's, it, it's, it's, it's very concerning. And, and with the G20 meeting today in Antalya, um, I haven't heard any leaders bring this issue up, and, and except for the European Union, a couple, I think, last week that brought up a, a very stern statement about how this is undermining democracy and other civil liberties. Um, I, think, I think it needs to be brought up by, by by Turkey's allies, including Canada. Does it surprise you it didn't come up, Amrin? Not really, um, especially since you know Turkey now uh, has opened the Injilik air airbase uh, to combat missions against ISIS. You know we're very much back to the sort of Cold War parameters where Turkey is, you know, regarded as a strategic ally in the war against, uh, you know, terror, and so that comes at the expense of, of you know democracy in Turkey, the European Union has lost its leverage anyway, had long lost its leverage because you had Angela Merkel and Nicolas Sarkozy come out and very openly express their view that they didn't believe that Turkey belonged in their club anyway. So, you know, the, the Europeans really don't have a, any moral leverage. And, well, the United States in Turkey, people still believe today that if any country in the world has the power to change things in Turkey, it's the United States. And that the United States should be using that leverage to, to help promote democracy. And there's a very concrete way that it could be doing that today. Mm -hmm. Because as you know, the Syrian Kurds are one of their foremost allies in the war against ISIS. And those Kurds that they're helping are closely linked to a group inside Turkey that has been fighting for autonomy, independence, it keeps changing inside Turkey, the PKK. 
And this government, to its great credit, was the first government to openly come out and say, and the president Erdogan to say that the state had made mistakes in its dealings with the Kurds. It went further than any of its predecessor in, predecessors in addressing the grievances of the Kurds. They, they started talking directly first to the PKK and then to their imprisoned leader, Abdullah Öcalan, and we all believed and hoped that finally we were on the road to a lasting peace. And it was very obvious to us when the conflict in Syria erupted and the Kurds began taking control of areas along the border, that reaching out to those Kurds would bolster the peace process inside Turkey. But what happened in Turkey was unfortunately that the old reflexes kicked in, the paranoia kicked in, the fear of, oh my goodness, after the Iraqi Kurds, now the Syrian Kurds are about to carve out you know, an independent statelet for themselves. And, and not only that, these Kurds are allied with the PKK. Oh my God, oh my God. So I think that was one big reason that the whole peace process in Turkey was put on the ice. And I think that what the United States could do is to use its leverage both over the Kurds, which it has now, obviously, because without the United States, Kobani would have fallen. And to use that leverage to bring the Kurds and the Turks back to the peace table. That's what I believe. I've kind of digressed that. No, <laughs> I'm sorry. I was supposed to be talking about the media. We can go back to that. I have a way to connected. get back there. I do have a way to get back there. We, we're not talking... when. We, we're talking about the kind of pressure that the United States or other outside actors might bring to But it have. would be a win-win for everybody because, you know, uh, we have this long border with uh, Syria, 900 kilometers. Nearly two-thirds of that is now controlled by the Kurds. So if you, the Turks and the Kurds work, work together, we, you could really, you know, do a lot of harm to ISIS. The business elite, the people who, who would also benefit from a peaceful border, from development in northern Iraq that spills over into, into southern Turkey, that, that might benefit uh, eventually from, from autonomy, as you say. That business elite, where is it? The, the, the people who, who, in most countries, are, have some influence over a political system in some way. Does it exist? At well, as you know, in the old days you had the army and then you had the business elite that was, you know, allied with it. Mm -hmm. But now power has changed hands, so you have power concentrated in the hands of Erdogan and he's created his own nomenclatura, his own business elite. And so they're in this symbiotic relationship where the survival of one depends on the other. And that's coming at the expense of, you know, a free press because this business elite has been encouraged to buy newspapers, to take over newspapers, which in turn become propaganda sheets mm -hmm. for the government. So that it's this whole phenomenon of media capture, which I'm sure your teachers or your professors are telling you about. And it's not just in Turkey, it's, it's a, a global phenomenon and a very f worrying one, particularly since the business model has collapsed, one where advertising is what sustains uh, newspapers. So how do you make money if you own a newspaper? Well, you make money by, with your other business interests. And how do you make money with your other business interests? By currying favor with the government, mm -hmm. by getting the contract to build X or Y highway or hospital. You diversify. So Kyle, is that one of the warning signals you're looking at, concentration of media ownership? Is that something that you could say, if you have this factor along with other factors, you've got, you're on the road to real human rights problems and real problems for civil society? Well, I, I think the suppression of journalists um, is, is, a, is a danger sign right around because it, it starts to show that a government is trying to um, to control the narrative or wants to shut out any other opposition or any other alternate views. Um, and the inclusion of businesses in that process, I think, I think is, very, is very worrisome. Um, I'm not saying that Turkey is going down that path, but if you look at many cases, many recent cases, authoritarian governments that, that um, try to grab and control too much, um, that lose hearing that other argument or, or, or lose a space for civil society, and the average public to actually express alternate views, that, that creates tension. It creates 
tension that uh, can eventually boil over uh, politically or sometimes in violence. And, um, and I would definitely flag that as an issue that uh, uh, I think governments like Canada need to do more to support in their, in their foreign development assistance to help build free media, to help groups like Journalists for Human Rights, uh, an NGO in Toronto that trains journalists and, and tries to work on policies. I think we need to be doing more of that in our foreign policy to ensure that um, those societies stay robust. Do you think there's a role to, for um, the Soros-like uh, Western, uh, Western financed NGOs to come in and train Turkish journalists? Does that do anything? Well, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Soros is a rather controversial figure. So. Let's put Soros aside then, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, yeah. let's talk about Soros Canadians for the, for the Journalists for Human Rights. Is there a role, is Turkey at a place where it's a question of training journalists? Um, training journalists, but then you need to give them a job. Mm -hmm. Who's going to employ them? How many tur Turkish journalists have lost their jobs oh, in, gosh, hundreds, in the last few years? Hundreds, mm -hmm. hundreds of journalists have lost mm -hmm. their jobs at all levels. I mean, we usually only hear about the prominent columnists, but their editors, their sub-editors, all kinds of people who, who have been sacked because they're deemed to be either critical of the government or somehow allied with a group that the government finds threatening. Uh, it's just incredible, incredible. It's become a graveyard yeah. for journalists. Mm. Turkey is a graveyard for journalists. So, where is the in, in this in the when we're talking about the importance of press freedom, the importance of um, independent media? Of course, it's you know it's 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 for all of us. It's a it's an important value and it's an important goal. Independent media, you know, transparency, the ability to 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 get and disseminate information, but the, the, the owner of that right, the right to free information, is the public. It's not you, it, as, as, you know, as, it's not me, it's not journalism, it's not media owners, it's the public. Is there a voice? Is there a public um, outcry? Is there a public sense that there's something missing in Turkey? And again, in your experience, Kyle, do you think that that, do you see that anywhere else where public demand for uh, more information, for freedom of information, for the protection of journalists, for the, the old standard marketplace of ideas has actually had any, uh, any effect on, who, on how things operate in a country? Let me start with, with Ambrin. Um, really? I've yeah. been doing too much of the Okay, talking. let's start with the I'll, I'll just talk, yes. and, and but, but my comments will never match her experience Where's, of actually yeah, so living and, and working as a journalist. But no, I, I think if we look across the world right now, I mean, journalism is in a very a period of flux, where uh, just in Canada, we talked about unemployed journalists in Turkey. Well, we have a lot of unemployed journalists here, usually because of budget cuts and because <laughs> of how media is changing. <laughs> Uh, not not, not because that, of yes. necessary <laughs> political oppression, although some of the CBC employees might think the last election has something to do with that. Um, but you look in, Tur in, in Egypt right now uh, with, the th with this military government that's took over and is putting journalists uh, through the ringer um, for a lot of the same security and terrorism uh, legislation that, that is being used against everyone to silence any critical commentary. Um, I, the one positive side I, I would say for this in this period of collapsing journalist, journalism uh, structures and, and outlets is that we have social media. And social media has allowed a lot of people to gain information uh, at relatively cost-free and to share with each other and trust their friends. But as again, in Turkey, um, we have seen that social media platforms have been shut down numerous times. Uh, Twitter uh, has been shut down numerous times. YouTube. Um, and actually, I was doing some research before this, and it turns out that 60% of requests to Twitter to shut down accounts or posts came from Turkey, came from the Turkish government. I think that's a sign. There is, what, 150 million people on Twitter, um, and if 60% of the requests to shut down Twitter content is coming from Ankara, that's problematic. What do you think? Uh, is, is, there, is, is there a muzzled public or a public that has just become so used to... You know, to that's a very, very interesting question, in fact. Um, and I was discussing this with some of your students, you, you before we, we came out here. Uh, you know, the idea of freedom as defined here in Canada might be quite different to how people in Turkey define freedom. What does the average Turk think of when, you know, you put the word freedom to him and he might respond, the freedom to educate my child, mm -hmm. the freedom to be treated with respect 
at a state-run hospital, um, the freedom to be able to walk on concrete instead of mud when I'm getting from my village to the town. So, uh, and the thing is that this government that is restricting our freedoms as would be defined in a Western context was elected popularly. Okay, it wasn't a fair election because of all the suppression of the media, but by and large it was a free election and 49% of the Turkish people voted for it. So what do we take away from that? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you bring about change democratically in Turkey? How, you know, because very often when we speak about the authoritarian government, the dictator Erdogan, in quotes, uh, it, it evokes countries like Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, where elections are pretty much of a farce, but they aren't yet in Turkey. So what does that say about Turkish society, about us, about Turks, you know? And I would put the same question about what's happening in, in Paris, what happened in Paris, about Muslims, about how they react to all of this. You know, these are very complex questions. Mm -hmm. So democracy, I mean, what, from what, what I gather, is so that democracy or even the sort of reasonable trappings of early democracy are no, that doesn't, that's not a, make you immune to having absolutely a totalitarian treatment of information and press. Um, is there a relationship? Does one get, can one maintain as perhaps one would argue in China or other places where there's freedoms here and no freedoms there and somehow the society goes along? Is that happening in Turkey? Can that, can that be sustained anywhere where if the economic development progresses, if people see that their lives are somewhat better in a material way, that it doesn't really matter? Well, I think that certainly in Turkey, the lack of democracy, the lack of rule of law for certain, is scaring away investors. You know, the business people are very nervous. Foreign investors are certainly nervous when they see the government go in and seize, you know, uh, the assets of a, a large conglomerate for purely political reasons. That's not very reassuring, is it? And the language that's used, you know, for instance, the government was accusing Lufthansa of being part of these protests against the government on the grounds that Lufthansa was really nervous that uh, this new airport that's being built would somehow steal business away from it, you know, would make Turkey the, a major hub, uh, you know, to the detriment of Lufthansa. This kind of language I don't think is, is very <coughs> helpful. And so you could argue that, you know, the extent you, to, to which you, the rule of law prevails and that you have a, a free uh, a society, that, that that will help business, that will help the economy. So over the long term, I don't believe it's sustainable. And in the case of Turkey in particular, I mean, the, the whole Kurdish issue is, is highly destabilizing. So, you know, to, 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 you can't imagine a scenario where keeping up this kind of uh, you know, military pressure on the Kurds is going to allow for a prosperous, stable kind of country. How do you see, and ideally and, pra and, and practically, what would be the steps to deal, with the, deal in, a, in a just way with, um, with Kurds, to take Turkey and Kurdistan to a more normal place, Still, but within the context of the kind of, we have to take, a, take note, um, major destabilization in that area with the neighbors and with, uh, and with the wars. Well, I think they were moving in the right direction when they engaged the group that seems to enjoy the support of a, a fair number of Kurds inside Turkey. And I'm referring to the political movement led, inspired by Abdullah Öcalan. Um, and they were talking to him. And what needs to happen, obviously, is that uh, their um, rights be enshrined in a new constitution. Because until they have constitutional guarantees, the Kurds are not going to feel secure. You know, as long as they don't have watertight, um, legally enshrined rights, they, they, they can never trust um, 
give, they cannot trust the state given the very painful history. And who could blame them, really, for, for not in, in f feeling that kind of confidence? I mean, okay, so this government promises them X, Y, and Z, but then a new government comes along and takes it all away. So what Turkey urgently needs, and not just the Kurds, is a, a new democratic constitution. But what we have is a president who wants a constitution that's tailored to match his own ambitions, which is to become an executive style president. That's what he wants. And it now emerges that all of his bargaining with the Kurds was very much predicated on extracting support concessions for that kind of a, a, a constitution that would give him all those powers in exchange for as yet undefined rights for the Kurds. Nobody knows mm -hmm. what was being offered before it was all taken off the table. What what was it that you did that personally attracted his attention to you? Well, um, <laughs> the first time I ever met him was back in 2002, and I was doing a profile of him for The Economist. And um, he, we met, and he was not yet the prime minister. He was the leader of this newly founded party that had broken away from the main Islamic party in Turkey. And we sat in a room and he had all his advisors with him and I asked him a question that made him uncomfortable about his relations with the army who, 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 was, who were clearly unthrilled by him and didn't want to see him get, go anywhere. And so he turned around to his aides and he said, you haven't trained this woman properly. And I was shocked because, you know, especially the way he said it in Turkish sounded very strange. And uh, so I, 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 published the, uh, I published my profile of him. And uh, it was a few months later, the elections had just, the campaigning had just started, the election that his party went on to win. And I was on a plane with him. We were going to Van, to Eastern Turkey. And when he saw me, he again turned around to his aides and he said, this one came along. <laughs> This one is here, and I felt really upset. I mean, I, I'm a rather emotional person, and I kind of lost my cool. And I went to the front of the plane to the other Akbar party members who I knew. I said, how can he say this? What, what does he mean? Um, so very early on, I caught on that he gets very personal with journalists. But I was a big cheerleader, as I explained to you. And, um, but apparently, that wasn't good enough for him, because when I saw him, I think it was a few years later somewhere, he, he said, oh, you praise my wife, because I actually quite admired his wife. Uh, for, I mean, I won't get into that, but she did some good things, especially with girls' education. And he said, you praise her, but you don't praise me enough. And I was like, okay. And then, a few years after that, uh, he decided to give me a chance. And so I was on a plane with him again, on an another campaign uh, trip, and he sort of leaned over to me and he said, I'm expecting good things from you, Amber and Zaman. And I guess he didn't get the good things that he expected. And uh, so when I was writing for this Turkish newspaper, I was a columnist and criticizing his policies. Uh, I eventually got fired. Uh, I was told several times, warned by my editors, if you don't stop writing in this fashion, we'll have to let you go. But obviously I didn't stop and I got fired. And uh, I think the reason he takes it so personally also is because I was, you know, very supportive initially. And so when people like myself, and I'm not the only one, please don't think I'm glorifying myself. Uh, please, there are many people like me in my situation in Turkey, many, way too many. I think it's because, precisely because we, we weren't like those others who from the get-go were saying, oh, Sharia's coming, they're going to put a veil over us, oh, you know, these people are dangerous. We weren't like that. We, we believed in them, and we thought they could change Turkey for the better. And I was among uh, the women who were, who were campaigning for the bans on the headscarf to be lifted. So we were credible voices. We weren't these, among these people who were reacting like the old elites. So when people like us began criticizing them, obviously, our voices carried far more weight. And I think that's why 
They, he finds people like myself threatening. So you're either all for him or else you're against him in, in, in his I'm mind. And of course, so. he's, not, he's certainly not but I think unique this among focus leaders of the world. on him is, yeah. is also misplaced because mm. it's not just Erdogan. It's, it's the system. It's the, it's the political system in Turkey that we hope could be changed, mm -hmm. but sadly hasn't. It's just that power has, sw has sh shifted into a new set of hands. And this focus on Erdogan, Erdogan, as I said, is misplaced because it, it, it uh, presumes that if Erdogan were to go suddenly, you know, everything would be wonderful. And, and that's clearly not the case. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, we're in a context where in Turkey, as we are in the rest of the world, certainly in Canada, um, in a kind of post 9-11 world where, as I mentioned in the beginning, there can be, it's so easy to, um, to start from a basis of, of laws that uh, criminalize certain behavior, that permit certain surveillance, that, that uh, are meant to protect the public from the enemy outside, um, where we've seen in the US where that has led to major surveillance, major threats on journalists, um, uh, intimidating people who might otherwise be sources. Um, certainly, I think here in Canada, we've come out of, a, out of a period where people within the government, officials, were, um, were intimidated as well from talking to the press and were uh, maintained a veil of silence over many things. We're now in even more, we post Paris, post Ankara, post uh, Beirut, and post all of the daily, daily misery and horror that's inflicted upon the people in the Middle East. We're in a time when people are legitimately concerned about security and perhaps are more open to uh, more draconian uses of the laws to, uh, to shut people up. Do you think that that's, am I overstating the case here? Am no, I think, stating that, there, I, that, that we, even here in, in Canada, can well, face I, I, an acceptance of the kind of ordinary day-to-day -day repression that Ambrin has experienced and her colleagues? I, I, no, I, I, th I think yeah, Canadians, we're, we're, we're people. We, we respond to the same, uh, the same thing that happens to people in Turkey. I mean, cultural differences, but we respond to, um, to what we perceive as threats or dangers that will affect our lives. And, and you know, I'd be lying to you if, if there wasn't somewhat of a shift in Canada after mm -hmm. we had the attacks on Parliament Hill and, mm -hmm. and um, then we had the introduction of the C-51 about looking at better surveillance and understanding how to deal with these non-state actors, um, particularly in the West, the sphere of religious extremists and what that means for our liberties and our freedoms. And, and we did see in the election there was a percentage of people that believed um, that we, we had to give up certain freedoms in order to have security. And I think that debate is only gonna be accelerated in Europe with what's happening in France, the three month state of emergency. Uh, we have similar legislation taking place in, in the UK. So there are these careful debates. Um, I think the real issue is, is you know, how do we ensure that our civil society and our journalists are well placed to call out our governments when they're lying about things or they're, they're using this for an ulterior purpose. And, and one of the issues not discussed, but in Turkey that, that we found out, a lot of journalists that were persecuted or silenced were reporting on, uh, on corruption. Uh, on, on personal business dealings of people in, in, the, in the Turkish government. So there's another aspect of that that, that we have to be very careful of. And, and we need our journalists and, and NGOs and the watchdogs to, to hold our governments to account. But, but we do see that. We see sometimes there are real legitimate threats that, that we have to adapt our laws to deal with these evolving threats. But we also have, we see a lot of governments will use the same argument uh, just to suppress political opposition or ideas they don't like. And, and I think that is a growing, a growing threat we see in the world. Let me just uh, we're, we're sort of wind down into here, but let me ask a, um, a, a question of you, Ambrin. Where do young people in Turkey, where do young Turks get their news? Where do they find out, if they want to find out, um, what might be happening in their country and what their country's doing and what might be happening in the outside world? Twitter. Twitter okay. is really big in Turkey, mm -hmm. incredibly big in Turkey, which is why they sometimes shut it down. And um, it's, it's wonderful, you know. Uh, Twitter, I think, is an incredibly important tool. 
and it allows people like me who got fired to continue to express our opinions even though we have to compress them into mm -hmm. 140 characters, which is a great discipline, <laughs> I think. It forces yeah. us to be smarter. <laughs> Uh, and yes, people turn to Twitter, but unfortunately, the government also uses Twitter. And they have their Twitter trolls who, who go after us. Uh, you know, it's almost as if they push a button and the next thing you know, you have all mm -hmm. these eggheads or, you know, people <laughs> sort of just attacking you, threatening you. I mean, it was terrible, especially during the Gezi protests. And women, women journalists, were especially targeted. And they would threaten us with rape, you know, tweets like, we're going to make you sit on a broken wine bottle. We're going to have impale you on that. In 140 characters. In 140 characters, you know. It was terrible because, you know, you tell yourself that it's just, they're just, you know, typing on a keyboard, what could they possibly do to you? But when it's unremitting and sustained after a while, it really does get to you, I have to say. Mm -hmm. It really does get to you. Um, and the same thing, ISIS does that too. In fact, uh, for a while they were going after me and in fact they'd photoshopped me. They had me in an orange jumpsuit and they had Jihadi John, you know, with his oh, uh, knife to my throat. And, you know, you try to laugh it off, but it does sort of bother you. <laughs> yeah, well, I can see why. I would say so, yeah. Is there hope, do you think, Kyle and, and Abrin, that, that social media, that restrictive as it has become, and I think Freedom House has, the Freedom House reports show that a, a steady decline in that freedom over the years in most places, particularly sharp in a place like Turkey, and, but even here in Canada, um, even against that backdrop, uh, is the hope of, for a free flow of information, for the ability of, um, of everyone to get a message out or to counter a message that's, that's uh, an official message, is it social media, do you think? I think social media, I mean, it empowers individuals. Um, it can also be used for wrong purposes. Mm -hmm. But it really empowers individuals to connect with others and find other people in society uh, that they might not have the time to physically meet in their neighborhood or another town, but to organize. Uh, we saw that in the Arab Spring, um, that uh, social media, Facebook and Twitter, became power, power, powerful tools. And I think for, for authoritarian governments, uh, one thing that drives them nuts, and they try to shut down Twitter, they try to shut down Facebook, is that they can't control it. It's a user-generated, uh, a tool that is controlled by servers outside of their country. And it, so I, I think, you know, I don't think the 21st century is going to be very kind to uh, control freaks um, because they can't control information. They can't control the voices of the people. They can shut down cell phone access. They can shut down the internet. But there are so many new technologies being introduced that allow individuals to bypass that. Um, there are activists in Syria that are being given software and internet connections that, that the authorities don't know about. So. I am quite positive that the social media and these new tools um, are in some ways going to be a, a thorn in the side of authoritarian governments that want to control everything, but they're realizing that it's hard to do in the 21st century. Uh, hope. <laughs> of course, we have to have hope. And at the risk of sounding horribly naive, I would, I would say that this is ultimately you know, as humans, we both harbor evil inside ourselves and good. And the, 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 la condition humaine, c'est vraiment ça, this constant battle between the good and the evil in us. And we have to keep trying to be good people. I'm sorry if that sounds very naive, but as a journalist, you know, I was a stringer for the Washington Post in the 90s and up until the early 2000s. And the managing editor of the Washington Post at the time, Steve Cole, came to Turkey. And I was considered kind of like somebody who seemed to be going places. I was, you know, filing a lot and going to Iraq and, you know, perhaps I was in line for a staff job. I was a stringer. So Steve Cole had dinner with me. And so we, you know, chatted and then he sort of finally said, so Amberin, what's your goal? <laughs> and I think he wanted me to say to be a staff reporter for the Washington Post. <laughs> but I gave him the wrong answer. I said, I want to be a good person. <laughs> and of course, I was never asked to become a staff reporter. <laughs> <laughs> 
But thank God, because, you know, I think being a stringer gives you a fallback position, which all these highly paid staff reporters don't have. So they get ulcers, you know, what if I lose my job? What if I lose my job? Whereas I have, I had all these different strings in my bow, and it worked pretty well, I think. And um, so... I think definitely it did. Except for the internet trolls, the yeah, being well, personally insulted by the president in public, and the hey, three I judicial owe him processes. thanks. He's made me famous. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> How could I complain? So before we finish, is there anything? Let me just give an opportunity to both of you. If there's anything which is much, which is a world of possibilities that we haven't covered or that I haven't brought up that you that you want to talk about, you you both made very strong cases that without some kind of res justice for the Kurds there can never be the hope of any stability in Turkey, and without stability in Turkey, perhaps no one will be confident enough to allow transparency and, and free expression. Perhaps, I, I'm trying to do, um, perhaps paraphrase that a little bit, but if there's more you want to say about uh, where things go. I'd like to make just one, go. one quick comment. I think yeah. that Canadians, Montrealers, need to realize this is important. Um, it doesn't only affect people in other countries, it affects us. Mm -hmm. um, Concordia as an institution, has created so many journalists going on internationally um, uh, and, and domestically through the communication and journalism program. We've had Mazir Bahari, an Iranian graduate of this university, arrested in Iran um, uh, when he was working for Newsweek and human rights activists worked together to get him out. And uh, we have a connection to this. This is not simply theory, it's real. And I want everyone to realize Concordia is playing a role in actually bringing these issues to the forefront because they're of a matter of important public policy. Bravo. I want to thank Concordia very much for having me here, and I'm incredibly impressed by how well organized you are, and, uh, and you're all very nice and friendly people, and so thank you so much. <laughs> and I want to thank IPI, obviously, I want to thank you, Susan, and I want to thank the Globe and Mail for helping make this happen. And uh, my final remarks would be that you know, Turkey is a very important country, especially given what's just happened in Paris with, with the rise of ISIS. You know, Turkey was, I've said this so many times, and he's heard me say it so many times, he's probably going to I'll fall asleep, again. is that Turkey was meant to be the panacea, the countervailing force to all of this. It was meant to be the country, the Muslim democracy, that proved that Muslims can govern themselves democratically. And, you know, unfortunately, this government missed that opportunity, and that makes me incredibly sad. And what I would say, finally, is that as Muslims, I'm a Muslim, I feel terrible that we're not doing more to, to show that the world that this is not what Islam is. And I would have hoped that my government, for instance, that's so good at mobilizing masses when it wants them to be on the streets to tell the rest of us how great their own party and government is. They managed to get a million people out there. They could have gotten those people out there to say, this is wrong, this is not Islam. We condemn those people. Why didn't they do that? That's what I want to know, and that's what should happen. And thank you. Thank you. Can go to questions. Yeah. Very good. Um, thanks again to IPI, as, as um, Amber and Kyle have said, and thanks very much to Concordia. Uh, this has been fun for me, but uh, I, th I have a feeling that you've probably got a million questions. I hope so. Um, so I think we can take questions now. Um, let me just to say, of course, you've heard this every time you've come to something like this where you're asked questions. I'll say it again. Um, a question, great. Um, let's not use the time, we've got very little time left for making a long statement, but we're very interested in to hear what questions you might have for either of them. So let us start over there. Uh, yeah, Hi. I just had a question. Um, Could you come a little bit closer to the mic, yeah, I think? Sorry, yeah, I'm so short. Or Come down, or up to the mic, yeah. <laughs> Can you hear me better? There you go. Okay. Um, I had a question about how um, you have to present yourself to AKP members or to Erdogan, um, given that you know, you're a woman, you're also very sweet-spoken, 
uh, which is not a derogatory thing at all. Um, but it's just uh, in, in our background, I guess, as women, um, it seems like we have to make up for being a woman with being extra assertive and uh, you know, g garnering all these other traits in order to be, come across as a strong person. So I'm wondering, being a journalist in Turkey and speaking to ACP members, do you feel like you have to change the way you speak or the way you act or the way you ask questions um, in order to be taken seriously or not at all? Thanks, so the question is, um, what adjustment did you make as a woman journalist, or did you feel you had to, um, in order to to uh, to deal with the AK Party or as anyone else? What role does gender play? I think being a, w I mean, this is a question that you know would apply to a woman journalist in any circumstances. I think let's not kid ourselves. It's still a very patriarchal world out there, um, and thank you, Justin Trudeau. Uh, uh, I think being a woman, in fact, and being perceived as sweet and as you described it, is actually an incredible advantage. It has been in my career, where precisely because they don't take you seriously, they let down their guard and tell you stuff they shouldn't be telling you. <laughs> uh, I think I, it served me very well being a woman. And I'm not suggesting that I was being flirtatious or any of that. No, not at all. Just being myself, but also observing that because I'm short, <laughs> like you, and soft-spoken, you know, people let their guard down. Uh, it's, it's, it's been great, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, New York. <laughs> um, hello. Uh, my question is for Amrin. Um, I'm a human rights activist and writer, and I've fallen into the category of journalist recently. Everyone keeps telling me I'm a journalist, so apparently I am one. Um, I experienced, when I started being very outspoken in 2012, um, I experienced some very uh, scary government repression, personally. I, um, people were breaking into my homes, I was receiving death threats, my dog got kidnapped, and finally I got thrown into psych wards. Um, so this is very personal for me, what you guys are discussing. My question to you is how, you got called out by the president, thankfully that hasn't happened to me yet. Um, what is your advice for somebody who's on a path, career path, looking back at your life, how to remain, I guess, safe? So the uh, question is how, given, given her experience, what advice would she give to those who are yeah, entering the business to, uh, to stay safe and to, um, to well, carry staying, forward the cost. Carry forward. When you talk about staying safe, I mean, obviously, if you're in a country where expressing, you know, to writing the truth gets you in trouble, if the choice you need to make is whether you believe strongly enough in what you're doing to continue or not. Um, and I would suggest that if you love your job and you believe in it, you just continue uh, regardless until you cannot continue, and if the price of that is being killed or going to jail, well, so be it. But in terms of keeping safe, I would, I would be, you know, very careful if I were going into Syria. I would, you know, I, I went into Syria last year, I think it was, and very foolishly took a picture of a Syrian Muhabarat um, in, installation. And I nearly got hauled off by them, so that was dumb. You know, you, tr you must really be very careful about what you do and not get overexcited and, you know, and wear your flak jacket, wear your helmet, and don't take unnecessary risks. And I'm very sorry about what you've experienced, and I hope it goes away. Thank you. Yes. Hello. Um, my question is for all three of you. Um, I recently watched a documentary that said Turkey oscillates between um, a secular and cosmopolitan nation and, to, and between one that is uh, conservative and Islamic. And I was wondering if you think that has anything to play in the media suppression that's happening today. Kyle, do you want to, you want to well, I, I mean, give Amber a break? Is I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll talk. I mean, yeah, Turkey is a country that, uh, at the start of the 20th century, 
moved to have a secular model through Ataturk. And there have been, uh, through its history, um, back and forth whenever there was seen to see a government that had Islamist tendencies, the military would, would stage a coup and take over. So it's had that long history. And I think a lot of um, uh, concerns or people, particularly in the West, have been watching Turkey in the last few years, seeing it creep more and more to, um, to be more Islamist and, and chip away at some of the secular nature of the state. Um, but I cannot attest if that's the reason why they've uh, been so hard on, uh, on, on the media or not. That, that's, that's something perhaps uh, you can expand on. I, I really don't think it's, it's, it's directly connected, no, that tension that you describe between secularists and Islamists. No, I think it's about power. It's about power and uh, holding on to power, whether it's the army or whether it's the Islamists. Uh, I think that's the real issue. Uh, hi, yeah. Uh, I find the idea of uh, targeting journalists uh, really interesting. I mean, this isn't only a Turkish problem. Uh, you know, just the idea of ISIS uh, strongly, like, slaughtering journalists and, and, and being so proud of it and, and denouncing journalism um, is something quite new. I mean, you know, like, I, I just, I find it really interesting. And I think, um, is enough being done uh, to protect freelancers? I mean, I speak to some of my teachers about, you know, even going to the Middle East, and they say, look, I, I would have recommended this 10 years ago, but you, sh you should not step foot in most of the countries that you're interested in going to. So, like, why is it that journalists, you think, are being targeted more now, and um, does it have to do with the companies that employ them, especially when it comes to freelancers? Uh, is there more that, you know, the Globe and Mail, is there more than the New York Times could be doing? I Thanks. think Susan Thanks. should answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to answer that question. Or human rights groups. I mean, whoever sure. wants to help. <laughs> Are they failing? Yeah. Well, we have a policy at the Globe. Um, we don't take work from freelancers who are not commissioned and who go to conflict zones. Um, we think, while we think, you know, it's clear, obviously, that the people who are on the ground covering what is happening in a place like Syria or Iraq or southeastern Turkey or so many other places um, are going to be either local journalists from those places or possibly freelancers because the number of full-time foreign correspondents, not just in Canada but everywhere, is, is dropping and there's not new ones coming in to, to take their place. That we recognize, but we also recognize that uh, it's journalists are targets not because, they're, not because they're journalists necessarily, but because they are the Westerners or the foreigners who happen to be in a place where um, that is, those, those characteristics have value to criminal groups. Mm -hmm. So we feel that when we send our own correspondents out, that they, they are equipped, they are equipped to communicate they are out on a communications plan where we need to know where they are at all times. We need to be able to know where they are so we know when they're missing. Um, they have the training, they have the communications, they have the backup of, a, of an organization. A freelancer, much as I, I, I really encourage and see the future of the business in people who are, who, who are courageous enough to be freelancers, morally and legally, we just can't accept that someone would go out to a, a dangerous area and, as has happened, get kidnapped, get taken by a criminal group. Um, we don't want to be responsible for that. We want to help people learn the trade and get safe, but these days, that's our policy. Thank you. Hello. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, I'm from Turkey. Well, I'm Canadian as well, and uh, I agree with most of the um, things said today uh, about my government, unfortunately, um, particularly by Ms. Saman. Uh, but I would like to bring another dimension to the argument. I think maybe she can address it. We are looking for just a government perspective and uh, how they are totalitarian against the uh, uh, journalists. But there is an ongoing problem in Turkey. Journalists against journalists as well, and as she knows very well, I believe she was working for Taraf newspaper, and during her time in before 
because of a lot of basically documents produced by Taraf newspaper, a number of journalists went to jail, about 20 of them, and they spent 20, no, five years and so on in jail. Can, without. Do you have a question too? Yes, I have a question okay, basically. The, um, the, the problem is that when those journalists were in jail, and I don't recall basically people like her or some others from the same political agenda people in Turkey were really against those uh, journalists being in jail. I mean, they were happy, those journalists, to be That's in jail true. most of the time. Maybe not, not for you, but we know basically a number of them. The issue is, is it really only the politician the problem in Turkey, or the journalists are also source of the problem in Turkey? Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a very good question, and the media has certainly been complicit. Uh, when I first started as a journalist back in 1992, uh, I was writing a lot about the Kurds because that's when the conflict was at its peak, and I was actually writing for a Canadian gentleman called Conrad Black, who owned the Daily Telegraph. <laughs> And um, the government was very unhappy with what I was reporting on, uh, 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 unhappy with my reporting. So they used the main Turkish newspaper called Hurriyet to attack me. And the next thing I knew was that I was on the front page and a, a photograph of mine, which I had given to the press ministry for my accreditation for my press card was used. So obviously the government gave them that picture because no one else had it. It was a pretty ghastly picture. And, um, you know, I was labeled a spy and this and that. So, you know, you know, power using journalists to target dissident journalists has been a recurrent theme in Turkey. Yes, you're absolutely right. But I would like to stress that I never condoned um, the arrests of those people you mentioned. On the contrary, I spoke up and wrote on their behalf unremittingly. Indeed. I think we probably, I'm looking for the organizers, um, have time for what, two more questions, perhaps? I see, uh, I can't, you, yes, okay, we can go, we can go. Okay, um, so, yes, why don't we go to you? Oh, uh, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> well, first, thanks to the panel, it's, uh, it's all very interesting. This is a question for um, Amberin. Um, I lived in Turkey for a long time. Actually, uh, I, I think I saw you during Gezi in Ankara, in the streets of Ankara. I was following you on Twitter. So, a big <laughs> fan. <laughs> um, my, my question is that uh, during my time in Turkey, I saw uh, an evolution in, um, in power, but not in all the stakeholders. That is, journalists fled the, main, the, the, the classical scene and went to Twitter, as you, as you know. The, um, the 140 journals exist. Um, you have also a lot of web-based uh, web uh, pages and uh, machines, uh, sorry, search engines that have come up. Uh, my question is, is more of a general one. You saw the evolution, you saw something that seemed to be a revolution for the political system in Turkey, that is the, the AK party's rise. But we saw that actually it was just a cycle. That is, they started, they did very well, and then we're back to the same old games that is the, the state within the Derin Devlet and the mafia and things like that. Um, what is, according to you, what, what kind of reforms would actually help Turkey? What is a transition to something else? I know it's a big question, but just an element, something that uh, you could tell us that could actually be done to push Turkey in a better direction. Well, first of all, you need leverage over the current government in order to have them push through the reforms because the opposition on its own is clearly not strong enough to do that. And, you know, with the suppression of the media, how do you create an atmosphere where the public is beginning to put pressure on the government for that kind of change? And to expect the European Union, or which now needs Turkey because of the refugees. You know, you saw Mrs. Merkel fly in just before the election and pose with Mr. Erdogan, you know, interesting timing. And the fact that, you know, uh, the United States needs Turkey because of Injulik. I mean, where does the leverage for that change come from? It's a very good question, and it's uh, very hard to see how you can harness enough um, pressure, you know, from, from the people, from the opposition, to, to make that happen peacefully. Yeah. How do you do that? I really don't know the answer right now. 
Was there ever a point when you thought there would be a Turkish spring at oh, Gezi absolutely. Park, for example? No, that wasn't when I thought there was mm. going to be a Turkish spring. I felt the Turkish spring in 2003, in 2004, for the first time I didn't you know, worry when I was writing uh, whether this would get me in trouble or not. I remember giving an interview to a newspaper that now attacks me constantly, a pro-Islamic newspaper, saying I've never felt this free before. You know, and I, I, I rem recall saying I wear my uh, k Turkish identity, this new Turkish identity that seems to embrace Kurds, Alevis, people like myself, like a comfortable old pair of jeans. That's what I said. And today I feel like my country is slipping away. It's, I, it's not my country anymore. I almost feel like I'm some kind of an exile. It's very sad. And I want my country back. I want your country back, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're, we're just about out of time to take one more question. Um, please, succinct, okay. uh, compelling, we, dramatic. I'll try. Okay. Uh, we heard about uh, journalistic red lines. Um, what is the degree of independence for uh, journalists in Turkey and in the region uh, when reporting about uh, the Kurds, uh, Kurdistan, and uh, some of their drive for independence? Big question. Um, well, in Turkey, you know, during this Turkish spring, it, 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 it was really a, a time when we felt we could write freely about the Kurds for the first time. You had a government that was talking to the PKK. You know, when I went to Kandil to interview the PKK leaders in the old days, you know, I was afraid to even take pictures because I felt I was scared that when I was crossing the border they would be used as evidence against me to prosecute me in, an, in a terror case. So I would just get rid of my film, how sad, you know, I wish I still had those pictures. Um, and I would devise all kinds of methods to hide my notes so I had this old sort of jacket that had a zip in the back for its hood and I put stuff in the inside there. <laughs> yeah. Or, um, I, I've said this before, so excuse me people who've heard this story before, I used to put my sanitary pads on top of my suitcase and put the other stuff under it and when they'd see the sanitary pad, they'd immediately <laughs> shut the suit, stuff like that. I didn't have to do that anymore uh, for a long time. You know, you could use the word curd, you could talk to PKK, but now, again, it's, you know, unfortunately, we're moving in the opposite direction once again. So now I, 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 I'm not confident that if I went back to Kandil, to Iraqi Kurdistan, to interview the PKK, that if I got that published, I wouldn't get in trouble again. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ambrun. You've been, you've been giving us a lot. Thank you, Kyle. Too much information. No, I think. no. The last I, think, bit was uh, I think we're all <laughs> we're all hoping for the best for you and uh, quite moved by your experience and the, your resilience and your integrity. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>